Good afternoon. Welcome to Coronavirus in Our Mental Health. Today is October 12th, 2022. And I'm Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Holly Eva on the North Shore. You may have noticed the title of this particular episode is The Deadliest Addiction, or How to Get Out of Tobacco Prison. Uh, and let me start off uh, with a connection between the coronavirus and tobacco use. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce you to our special guest, Tony. But that, let's, let me talk a little bit about uh, coronavirus and what's been happening with tobacco use, because it's really interesting. Tobacco use has gone up during the coronavirus for the first time in 20 years. It's up by 14% in this country. The opposite is also happening. There are less people who are trying to quit using tobacco during the coronavirus. So we're losing at both ends. We're getting more, we're smoking more and we're quitting less. And so that's a major, major concern uh, with what's going on. Um, now, don't let that discourage you, however, because like I said, I've got my special friend and guest today, Tony Barron. She was on the show a couple of months ago and she was talking about uh, the joy of helping people. And we were focusing on her work with the inmates in the Hawaii prison system and how she's been a great help to them. Well, today we're gonna focus on her work with tobacco cessation. Tony ran a very successful tobacco cessation program for the army at Schofield Barracks for 11 years uh, and had one of the most successful programs that I've ever seen in the islands. So she's really up on tobacco, and I'm really happy that she's here to join us today. Welcome to the show, Tony. Thank you for asking me, Ken. I just love talk. I love you, and I love talking about this subject. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Tony. <laughs> yeah, I was just, just going to say before we start uh, that I just wanted to tell the people that Tony is doing a special favor for me today because she's really feeling under the weather. She's got a cold. Uh, and you might be able to hear it in her voice, but I'm just really appreciative. Uh, thank goodness it's not COVID or it's not pneumonia, but uh, I know Tony's feeling not at her best, but uh, uh, I really appreciate uh, you being here, Tony. Thank, thank you. you. And it's not a smoker's voice either. <laughs> Truly. Although I, I am most blessed that it's not, I was smoking three packs a day 24 seven so that I don't have some terrible ramifications from that. I'm very lucky. Yeah, uh, that's the, for sure. The reason that I'm anxious about this conversation is uh, I think that true tobacco lovers that I'm speaking for and to um, don't want to lose their best friend. And most have tried stopping many times and failed. So I believe the reason we fail is we don't know what's going on. We don't know how long we're gonna feel this terrible way of, of deprivation. Of uh, There's a true honest to God sense of mourning that we're losing this life, not only this friend, but this lifestyle. We lose a lot of friends who are smokers. Um, and I think the reason that the failure is so high is because we don't truly understand the process and the process can be managed easily. No expense, no suffer. Well, you know, I suffer a little bit, but you know, <laughs> you'll live, you'll live. So, and I want to give you some tools uh to if it's if you're not the tobacco user then someone you care about uses and you might give them just one of these tools that will help them get over that hump and say oh yeah i can see a difference now so uh fire away yeah I, and we're certainly going to get to those i'm very anxious to uh, talk about those tools and tony's got a lot of them in her toolkit but uh i was going to suggest that we start tony at the very beginning that first puff of smoke, the first taste of tobacco, what gets people started on this uh, deadly path? They're doing it with somebody else. They're not doing it by themselves. It's very, very, very rare for a, a person to start smoking alone. They don't do, they do it to rebel against their parents. They do it to be just like their parents. 
They do it to be part of the crowd. They do it, um, you know, after sex, they do it at a meal. It's a very, very social encounter. And when you're out socially, that's a great icebreaker. Oh, would you like cigarette? Can I give you a light? Yeah, that's absolutely true, you know. And uh, But I was thinking more of uh, when we're very young. Uh, there's been a recent study that's come out of Sweden uh, in the past couple of years that has a lot of people uh, responding to their surveys and they're doing a lot of data analysis on it. And what they're finding is that the average age to begin uh, smoking is 10 to 13. And uh, by the time that the, the kids are 14 to 15, it's already starting to morph into a habit. That's right. And so this is, uh, this is something that's very depressing. And I was hoping you could start with that, with the young kids and how they get it. Well, they get it because their friends are smoking. I started in the fourth grade uh, at the movie theater in the girls' bathroom. That's where all the girls congregated and passed a cigarette around. I didn't do it by myself. So there's another a second influence there. They're not doing it by themselves. Is that well, any good question or no? Yeah, uh, but let's let, we can explore it a little bit. Uh, a lot of times, you know, and I talk to kids, uh, they're saying, well, my brother turned it on to me, my older brother or my older sister, you know, right. they're smokers. Right. And so they turned me on to it. Or my parents are smoking all the time. And there's lots of cigarettes around the house. Right. And so it's very easy for me to do this. The sad thing is that it also works in the other direction. They can they can pick up their habits from the their family or friends around them, like you're saying, but even when it's going in the opposite direction, when their parents are smokers and they tell their kids, don't you ever smoke. I don't want you ever to take up tobacco. And uh, the older brothers and sisters saying the same thing, don't do this. And yet they pick it up just like, you know, not that much differently than when the parents or the siblings or the friends are encouraging them. And that, you know, makes me stop and think, oh my God, you know, how do I, how do I deal with that? Well, the kids will, themselves will tell you, I'm not going to smoke. Oh, it's, it's dirty. Oh, my teacher said this is what will happen to me. And uh, I've talked to lots of little kids who said never, never, never. And of course, by the time they're 10, 12, 13, then the peer pressure kicks in and that's another story. Oh, and let me tell you another thing about that first puff when you cough and gag and choke and spit and all that. Everybody goes through that. There isn't a person that takes that first hit and says, mmm, yummy, because <laughs> it tastes like crap. Now, I when I would tell my classes this, they'd say, oh no, I really I I I didn't cough and spit and you know I, I liked it. The reason that they liked it from the beginning was they were half addicted before they ever took that hit. They were at the dining room table with a smoker. They were in a closed car with a smoker. They spent their young life sitting next to watching TV with a smoker. So they're half halfway there before they ever put it in their mouth. That brings us to uh, secondhand smoke, which I also love to talk about. Because, you know, in my dealings with people who had abused tobacco, uh, oftentimes they will not quit for themselves. You can point, them, point out to them all the problems that they're encountering, all the things that they're doing to their body, and they won't stop to help themselves. But if they're parents, uh, the thing that I found, uh, and I was going to ask you about, is that one of the most effective things is to point out the secondhand smoke and what it's doing to their kids. And that seems to be a key to getting a lot of people to stop smoking. Is that what you find as well, Tony? Uh, well, I'm sure that's uh, part of the, the population. The other part is the kids ride their backs. Oh, mom, what I heard in school today, I don't want that to happen to you. And the kids get scared. So then they really bear down on the parents and it brings me to a memory of a, a couple out of Schofield where the, what, the wife was a nurse and she would look at x-rays and all the things that you see with somebody who's got cancer, all the things that happen to you with smoking. And then on her break, she'd go out on the deck and light up. 
she and her husband came because their kids just bludgeoned them to get into some kind of program. So they came. She was not too happy to be there. He said, oh, yeah, I can't wait to get rid of this. Oh, no, this is really great. Well, guess which one did best? <laughs> I can guess. Tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, the, the nurse. And again, I think it's because she got tools. She under it wasn't a threat. Oh, they look at this terrible picture of your lung or any of that. It was, oh, uh, let me tell you why you're smoking. Let me tell you what you can do about it. Let me tell you how long you can expect it to last and give them some sense of control. And that's why I was anxious about this conversation today is let people know what uh, what they can do to ease the transition. That's basically what's going to happen. The insidious thing that I find is that when we're using tobacco and we're thinking to ourselves, I want to quit. And it's up here. It's I'm thinking about this and I'm saying, I need to quit. I need to quit. Uh, and then people, while they, you know, their brain is telling them to quit, oftentimes they find themselves lighting up and they don't even realize it. It's almost a physiological automatic response that has been sort of bred into them, into this habit. And they're, they pick up a cigarette and they're smoking it before they even realize what they're doing. Uh, and they may have had, say, like uh, two days without a, a cigarette. And all of a sudden, it's really depressing when you find a cigarette in your mouth and you didn't even realize how it got there. No. The other things that I'm, I'm, you know, that goes along with it is not only the physiological response, but also the sociological response of triggers. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about how we overcome uh, the triggers that kick us off to smoking and how we battle our own habit of picking up a cigarette without even realizing it's going. Yeah. Well, if you haven't smoked for two days and you pick it up, you're slobbering to put that in your mouth. So don't let them kid you. They know it's there. So there's three basic hooks that are going to uh, trigger you to light up or to want one. And basically it's a thought, yeah, that I would like to have a cigarette now. So one of them is addiction. If you smoke on a regular basis, you don't not smoke at work or you don't uh, you don't smoke regularly, but uh, you know, like an hourly or that kind of thing. Um, if you're maintaining a drug level, then that's part of your addiction. If it's a habit where uh, after you put down your fork at the dinner table and you pick up the matches, that's a non-thinking. You're not aware of it. It's just the way you live. Um, and then the third uh, hook is the smoke screen. People who use tobacco, you, they'll, they'll tell you, oh, well, it calms me. It relaxes me. It, it, it's uh, my reward for a job well done. And basically what it does is deaden us. The body thinks we're in a burning building and it sucks all the blood from our extremities. That's why we have such poor circulation to our vital organs. So um, it gives us that respite, that moment of leaving whatever is uh, stressing us when we when we light up okay that brings us to the point that i was i wanted to ask you about that uh, both that and we'll get back to the deadening in a minute but uh that having the cigarette uh, you know at the dinner table you know uh it's it's right there and all of a sudden you find yourself picking it up that automatic response well uh i'm going to ask you about what tools we can use maybe uh throwing the uh keeping the cigarettes off the dining room table or i'm sure there are lots of other things uh, but the other thing is, how do we satisfy the needs, like the needs for relaxing or, uh, you know, or finding a respite, uh, a spot where we can sort of pull back from what we're doing and just take a moment? Uh, how do we satisfy that need of needing a timeout? Let me, let me ask you, my darling, as a non-smoker, what do you do? Yeah, uh, you know, I... That's a good question. You know, a lot of times I'll sort of uh, look around me, you know, and that's a nice thing to do in Hawaii is every time you look around, you're going to see beautiful things. Uh, and that sort of calms me or 
if I'm lucky, my cat's going to jump up on my lap and say, uh, I need some petting. And I'm just going to say, oh, yeah, excuse me a minute. I'm going to pet my cat. <laughs> yeah, sure. lots, of, lots of different things. But that's for me. Uh, what are some of the other things that might help other people that maybe don't have cats around or maybe live in a place? Well, that, that, uh, that's the whole point, Ken. That whatever age we started smoking, we started using this device to disconnect from the moment, from what's going on is the time we um, um, deaden our lifestyle, our communication skills, especially our communication skills. You know, if you're upset and angry with somebody, it's much easier to say, I got to go out for a smoke or you know, I got to empty the ashtray or get some matches or something rather than staying with that uncomfortable uh, conversation. So that's one of the, the, the double-sided coin. The good news and the bad news is your life will change. And the change can be um, an emotional roller coaster because they're dramatic changes. But if you'll hang in there, the payoff is really nice. You know, that's a you know, great point that you're making. And it's a point that applies to a lot of different problems. Living in the moment instead of worrying about the future or regretting the past, but living in the moment and enjoying that moment. And that's easy to tell people. It's easy to tell ourselves, but it's oftentimes very, very hard to do. Uh, what are some of the ways that you help people uh, pull back and uh, live in the moment uh, and enjoy what we've got to enjoy? You know, especially during this coronavirus time when there's so many things that are making us really negative and feeling bad, like the uh, like the potential of war, the war in the Ukraine, uh, the climate change, all that stuff is very, very negative. And it's hard for us to pull back, like you're saying. Uh, what are some of the things that you help people pull back with and uh, uh, live in the moment? How do you help them do that? Well, the first thing is to learn how to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because if we're hungry, we'll light up. If we're over full, we'll light up. If we're unhappy, we'll light up. If we're happy, we'll light up. So to stay in the moment is to understand what's going on with ourselves rather than acting like a robot. And how do we do that? How do we, how do we monitor ourselves? People are notoriously not very good at monitoring themselves. Uh, they're sort of going, a, going along with what's happening around them. It's a process. And uh, I heartily encourage anybody who uh, wants to try, whether it's the first time or the 15th time to, to get away from this habit, is to get with a support group, uh, cancer society or private groups. I have a friend, she has nicotine solutions. She's been giving classes to corporations and individuals for 40 years now. And to have somebody there say, oh yeah, that happened to me too. Oh, I didn't know that was the reason why this happened. So to have it make sense really helps. Absolutely. Um, also, one of the nice things that's, uh, I think, available to people, uh, now that we're starting to reconnect, uh, and it's been difficult because we haven't been able to connect up very well during the coronavirus, especially physically. But now that we're starting to reconnect, uh, one of the things is there has to be a lot of people who have either quit smoking or have never smoked. Uh, and we can connect up with them and get some support from them uh, if we're not in a official group like you're talking about, which I think is a great idea. Uh, but there are also unofficial ways to- uh, Right. Yeah. And especially let people know that you're yeah. having some problems with this right. and people yeah. are anxious to help. Right, create some accountability for yourself. Oh yeah, I told everybody I was quit quitting and a lot of people don't like to do that because they failed so many times before. It's another embarrassing situation for them. But to uh, have accountability and to have a friend who say, uh, I never smoked and I don't understand what you're going through, but let's go for a walk. Let's go down to the beach. Let's Terrific. have a cup of tea, something. You know, that brings us to another point, you know, which is... Uh, really depressing for me is that tobacco of all the drugs, and I worked in most of my career in substance abuse, which took in all these different drugs. Um, this was definitely the hardest of all the drugs to uh, quit. And I know in your program, uh, Audit Schofield Barracks, uh, 
we once did a survey and found out that people had quit uh, not just one or two times and failed, or three or four times, but uh, 10 or 12 or 14 right. times that they right. tried to quit and they quit, but then they went right back and they fell, right. you know, they fell off the wagon, so to speak. Uh, the more so than any other drug that I've, I've ever encountered, whether it be uh, cocaine or alcohol or uh, fentanyl, you name it, tobacco seems to be the most difficult. In, insidious. Uh, it's insidious. And go, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, I mean, when people have failed that many times, and I know that they were in your program and having failed that many times, how do you convince them that it's not going to happen again? How do you say we can do it this time? You know, that seems to be, you know, one of the things that I really uh, admired about your program was that you were able to overcome that, that negative feeling. Well, I'm going to fail anyway. You know, I've done this before. I know I'm going to fail. And how you dealt with that uh, had to be a great part of your program. Well, each time they failed, they could have learned something from that experience. They could have learned where the thin place, thin place on the pond, the ice on the pond was thin. So mm -hmm. they say, oh yeah, well, next time I won't go out and celebrate my uh, tobacco sobriety by going to a bar. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not a good place for me now. Doesn't mean you can't go to a bar again. No, it just means that while you're in your recovery stage, while you're in your healing stage. And that's another thing that I wanted to touch on that uh, people are, tobacco users are very afraid of withdrawal. They hear all these terrible withdrawal stories. And I want to encourage the person to flip that concept to uh, from instead of withdrawal to see, it, uh, see them as healing symptoms. So if you get cranky, one, you're missing your best friend. Two, you're scared. Three, uh, withdrawal from nicotine can be const constipating. And if you don't take a poop for three days, you're going to be very, <laughs> very mean. Yeah, that's for sure. So, well, three days seems to be the magic marker. I mean, you know, we've talked about this before 72 hours, and basically all that tobacco is out of your system. But so many times people fail not during that, those three days. Uh, as painful as they are physiologically, but they lose it later on. Uh, and that seems to be mostly, uh, that, not totally psychologically. Uh, that, is, that is because it's their beloved. Mm -hmm. And how and, do you get them to uh, separate from their beloved? How can we get a divorce in with them with their beloved? Same way you got a divorce from your person that you were loved of and came home and beat you up. <laughs> okay. There's no difference. Uh, you do it gradually in small steps. And you every time you hear one of those beloved thoughts in your head, you say, stop. That's BS. That's not true. Uh, it doesn't taste delicious. It isn't my best friend. Uh, it do, I don't have to smoke to keep my weight down. All those gazillion positive associations we have with tobacco can be disconnected if we're alert and we are willing to go through the steps. Well, the tough part that I always saw about that was the forever syndrome. Uh, when we're talking about uh, young kids and then uh, young adults who have an addiction, the problem with tobacco is similar to the problem that we have with alcohol and that both of these are long-term debilitating illnesses, uh, which wind up cutting years off of your life, you know, uh, five, 10, even 20 years off of your life that you could have lived. But at 20, that seems a long way away. And you don't, you know, you think, well, it's the future's never going to arrive, you know? Uh, and so I can keep on doing this because it's not like Somebody is planting bruises on my face. Bruises are coming inside. And we don't see that so much, you know? And let, uh, that's what's scary about that. Yeah. Let, let me tweak your thinking on that. Rather than giving up the last five years of your life, how about this afternoon when you go to this party and if you want to have a cigarette, you have to go outside and leave the party that you're with? How about when you hug somebody and they pull back because you stink? You know, it's not five years at the end. It's the quality of your life every single day, regardless of your age. Yeah, that's a point well taken. I really, I really like that. I think that's 
if people can embrace that, that will help a lot. I really it does. Appreciate that. All yeah. these little things, you know, each one has its value. So that's why I'm saying education really does work. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we're running short on time, Tony. So let me uh, skip to the to the end and tell us uh, if there's one thing that you really want to say that we haven't uh, dealt with about uh, helping people uh, give up tobacco or helping them help their friends give up tobacco. Uh, what would that uh, one thing be that you could I would say stop, stop saying give up tobacco and say get rid of it. Okay. And uh, in place of it, we would put... Get rid of tobacco and see what shows up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's a whole new life, and that's part of the scary part, but the rewards are there if they'll do it. Yeah, and and I'm hoping that the people watching this program uh, will, one, feel hopeful that you've given them hope on how to do this, uh, and two, get some self-assurance that it can be done, uh, even with the most hardcore a person who's really hooked on tobacco, this can happen and your life can improve. Um, I started when I was eight. I got rid of it when I was 40. I was doing three packs a day. So there is hope. <laughs> That's terrific, Tony. And uh, I think Tony's, your life has really uh, shown that you not only, uh, have given up that, but you've gained so much uh, in your helping other people. And uh, I know that they appreciate it and I certainly appreciate it. And thanks very much for, for being with us today. My pleasure, thank you. And I wanna thank all the people out there watching. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and thanks to Think Tech Hawaii for Jay and uh, Haley and Eric and, and Michael. Uh, we really appreciate all your support with this. Now, one last thing before I go, Okay, the Great American Smokeout is coming up, and I want to really mention that. It's the third Thursday of November. Very easy date to remember because the fourth Thursday of November is Thanksgiving. So just the week before Thanksgiving is the Great American Smokeout. And if you listen to the program today and think, I've got to try this, I've got to try giving up tobacco, this is the perfect way to do it. We'll get rid of it for one day because so many other people in this country will be giving up tobacco for that one day for the Great American Smokeout. And you, will, you wanted to add to that, Tony, real quick. Getting rid of it. Getting rid of it, yeah. The, the byword, I keep forgetting that byword. I'll remember that, Tony. We'll get rid of tobacco and we'll get rid of it at the Great American Smokeout. So remember that. It's going to be November 17th this year, one week before Thanksgiving. You can't miss it. Give up that thing and see how it changes your life. And thanks again, everybody, for, for tuning in. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.